so uh, a long time ago, in a building pretty much on the other side of campus as part of my PhD coursework, uh, I took a class with Professor Alice Kuzniar on the subject of animal studies. Now, for the unfamiliar, if you are unfamiliar, animal studies is a relatively young field which looks at animals or conceptions of animals or animal-human relations in a variety of cross-disciplinary ways. Uh, so speaking very generally, a common aim of animal studies is to understand animals as beings, uh, as beings in themselves, separate from our knowledge of them, if such a thing is possible. So it tends to be kind of critical of the broad tendency to treat animals as extensions of human beings. Uh, now, part of course of this field is looking at animals and the way that they're represented or used in media. Now there's plenty of discussion about art and film, but not from what I could tell from my little exposure, a lot of discussion about video games. And it seems to me that this is a bit of a deficiency in the conversation. Um, I hardly need to point out to you guys, although I will anyway for context, uh, that video games are not a minority activity and animals are fairly ubiquitous in video games. Uh, it's an interesting thought to me that many people will only encounter many species of animals through their virtual representations. Uh, me, for instance, I have never ridden a horse. I have touched one at arm's length, it was kind of awkward, uh, but I've never actually ridden one. In a video game, of course, I am an absolute horse master, I'm pleased to say. Uh, so I did a little bit of reading into what has already been written on the subject of video games from the perspective of animal studies. Uh, I kept the focus of my research on portrayals of animals which attempt a sense of realism as opposed to say anthropomorphic animal characters. Um, and having done this, I narrowed my focus to identify the most seminal and salient works which I have summarized for your convenience on this slide. Not that slide on this slide. There we go. So there is not a lot of conversation happening on this subject. So in the absence of pre-existing discussion, uh, I had to fall back on good old textual analysis. Uh, so what I'm going to take you through in this talk uh, is basically some of my own musings and conclusions on this particular subject. Now, it's hard to make a statement about video games as a whole because they're so diverse. Uh, so I decided to narrow my focus to a particular style of gameplay. Um, now, it's worth mentioning that for the sake of scope, I am excluding from my conversation anthropomorphized characters. Uh, these are pretty much human beings in animal suits. I'm interested in depictions of real animals. So I decided to focus upon a particular style of gameplay that I'm going to call open world action adventure. Uh, the definition of genres can be a little bit fuzzy, uh, but I think you can make a case for these descriptors. Uh, in action games, the player takes control of a character with a certain repertoire of available actions or moves. Uh, the player deplo deploys these moves using manual dexterity and fast reaction time to navigate the obstacles of the game. Adventure games are characterized by their story-driven nature uh, and their encouragement of exploration by the player, uh, and some often gameplay focused on puzzle solving. Open world games provide a sizable virtual environment which the player can navigate with a large degree of freedom. So the player is given a great deal of choice in the way in which they move through the game world. Uh, if there are goals provided, the player has some choice in the order or timing of their completion. So you stick these together and you have a kind of gameplay which ought to be very familiar, where you take control of a character, move through a big world, solve problems, beat people up, generally be a badass, that kind of thing. Uh, so, do, 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 yes. Now, the nice thing about these kinds of games is that they put an awful lot of importance on the relationship between the player and the world around him. So, they encourage a lot of engagement with the game's environment. So, I might bring in some other games as illustrative examples, but this is broadly the kind of gameplay that I was focusing on uh, while reflecting upon this. Now, in Professor Kuzniar's class, I mostly focused on these two games over here. Uh, if you've read the abstract for this particular talk, you'll know that I'm mostly focusing on that one. 
So let's start with generalities and then move on into specifics. First of all, uh, it's important to note that the video game is inherently an anthropocentric medium. I have long suspected that I am secretly the most important person in the universe. In video games, this becomes true. Uh, because, the sim because we are living, uh, working with a simulated world, being created with limited resources, the creators have to pick and choose which parts of reality will get represented it within it. So everything becomes oriented in relation to the experience of the player character. So within the game world, I am just flatly more important than anybody else. And everyone else is important mainly in the ways that they relate to me. If I'm not in a position where I'm not, a, where, if I'm in a position where I'm unable to see something, that thing is probably not even being represented spatially. So this, an, the animal studies notion that I mentioned earlier of an animal that can be conceptualized distinct from human beings is a thing that is just not going to get expressed within video games. Uh, animals that appear in the games get their meaning from their relationship with the player character. Now, broadly speaking, we can cat categorize human-animal relations in video games into a little bit of a framework. When sorting the role of the animal into one or more of these non-exclusive categories, the first question to ask is whether a player is capable of having a consequential interaction with the animal. Uh, a consequential action I am defining as an interaction which changes some variable or number associated with the player character. And I hope you'll see what I mean as I go along. So if the player character does, if the animal does not change anything about the player, if they are not capable of consequential interaction, they are ornamental. Ornamental animals add a sense of verisimilitude verisimilitude to the game world. Uh, sometimes you may be able to have inconsequential interactions with them. For example, in some Legend of Zelda games, you can pick up a dog, at which point your choices are to walk around with the dog or put the dog down. Uh, other times, uh, the animals will appear distantly enough that you uh, will appear distantly, uh, sorry, pardon me. Other times, they will appear distantly enough that you can't touch them. You won't actually be able to physically interact with them. Or they may not actually be represented as an entire organism. Uh, the sound of birdsong, for example, might be a part of the ambiance of a forested area, but you will not actually, do not actually need to see any birds. Animals which can affect the player, if, if the animals can affect the player, then the effect can either be beneficial or antagonistic. Antagonistic animals act as monsters. Uh, animals in this role tend to have a very limited AI and a small set of moves which they are able to deploy against the player. For example, in Red Dead Redemption, you can encounter cougars. Uh, if you find one, it will try to kill you. If it cannot kill you, it will retreat. Then it will circle around you and try to kill you again. This is the entirety of the cougar's existence within the game. When animals are beneficial, the value of the animal is either located in something provided by the animal or by the animal itself. In the former case, the animal is a resource. Uh, the thing provided might be an inventory item like a pelt or, or something more ephemeral like experience or health or even progress towards a goal. Uh, as an ex an, a funny example of this, if you punch a sheep often enough in Minecraft, it will transform into wool for you. So that animal is a resource. Uh, if the animal, though, in and of itself is useful to the player, it will usually be as a tool. In this role, the animal functions as, a kind of, as an extension of the player's repertoire of abilities. So it either adds to the actions available to the player or improves upon the actions that the player already has. And the quintessential example of this kind of an animal is the horse. Uh, in, many, in pretty much any game in which it appears, the horse is there to help the character move faster. In open world games, the long distances involved may make uh, often make traveling by foot an exercise in hair pulling tedium. Uh, so the, the game often involves some way in which the player can change the way they move through the world. And sticking in horses is a very easy way to do this. So let's look at Red Dead Redemption in particular. 
So if you're not familiar with this particular game, it's set during the decline of the American frontier in the year 1911. John Marston, a far former outlaw, has his wife and son taken hostage by the government in ransom for his services as a bounty hunter. With no other choice, Marston sets out to bring three members of his former gang to justice. The players in this game ex explore a fictionalized version of the Western United States and Mexico. In addition to accepting missions to advance the story, the players can encounter random events including public ha hangings, ambushes, pleas for assistance, encounters with strangers, gunfights, and of course, dangerous animal attacks. Uh, animals, both domesticated and wild, are in abundance. This is a, uh, a screenshot of the Red Dead Redemption website. And so the abundance of animalia is in fact a big selling point of the game. Uh, some animals are owned, although interestingly, there is not a single animal that is named. Uh, the wildlife provides very simili verisimilitude, but none are completely ornamental. Any wildlife can be interacted with. Uh, mostly this interaction involves hunting. So any animal that is encountered can be killed for some kind of reward. So birds give feathers, things on the ground give skins or pelts or bones or what have you. In some cases, hunting animals plays a part of the player challenges, which can unlock rewards. So players counter coyotes, wolves, uh, birds, snakes, cougars, bison, and of course, horses. Now, obviously, in a game which is basically a love letter to the Western genre, uh, horses are going to possess a particular importance. So Red Dead Redemption puts a lot of care or apparent care into its representation of hor horses. It wants you to like these horses. It wants you to feel for them. So horses in Red Dead Redemption are capable of complex behaviors, mostly around reacting to their environment and exhibiting self-preservation instincts. For example, the horse will generally refuse to jump off a cliff despite attempts by the player to guide it over, uh, or will become panicked when riding too close to the edge of a, a steep drop. They will shy away from gunfire and animals, especially snakes, and will get nervous and spooked by any potentially dangerous animals moving towards the, that, moving towards the player or uh, moving nearby the player. Uh, there, there, a lot of care was put, uh, put into their representation, particularly their movement. I'm told they have very realistic gaits. Now there are roughly 20 breeds of horses which may be acquired or tamed with varying temperaments and stamina. A horse's loyalty can be improved by treating it well, although in this game treating it well mostly involves feeding it apples and riding it often and for long distances. The main reward for treating it well and gaining increased loyalty is more stamina. And here we start to see where the realism of the simulation starts to break down a little bit. Because while there are a number of different horse breeds in the game, the primary way that the player is going to get to know these horses is through their statistics. Uh, different horses have different levels of top speed, health, levels of stamina. Stamina, notably, is displayed for the player and acts as a rechargeable resource. So if the player spurs his horse to the point where the stamina is depleted, they become exhausted and buck you off. So in terms of the number of breeds that I mentioned, of the 20 breeds that I mentioned, 17 of these are actually just two sets of statistics with different skins overlaid. So from a certain perspective, there's only two horses. Uh, in one of the earlier story missions available to the character entitled Wild Horses, Tamed Passions, uh, the focus is around the capture and taming of a group of wild horses. The climax of the mission involves Marston chasing down the pack stallion, eventually receiving ownership of it as a reward for his efforts. And that's actually this horse that's, picture, that's uh, pictured over there. Now this horse is interesting because this, this particular breed in the game is called the Kentucky Saddler. Uh, statistically, it's one of the three best breeds of the game. There's only one other breed that's faster and only one other that has more stamina. Now, of all the abundant animals in the game, this is maybe one of three that is assigned a sex, which is interesting. Uh, this mission happens very early uh, and treated well. This horse can last you the rest of the game. It often doesn't. Everybody has their memorable video game experiences. Here's one of mine from this game. 
So I'm John Marston. I'm exploring the wilderness, having recently acquired this animal. Uh, my horse and I are traipsing uh, merrily through the brush when the air is rent by howls. We are beset by wolves. I know I, ha I know I have only a moment before they are attacked because they are wolves, and that is what wolves do in this game. Uh, and so I twist my character towards the nearest movement and hit the buttons to draw and fire my gun. Time slows, and I watch as my character, on his horse, draws his weapons, locks onto the wolf, follows it as it runs around in front of the horse, and shoots my magnificent steed, my loyal, hard-won steed, right between the ears, right out from under me. So how do you recover from a thing like that? I will tell you how I recover from a thing like that. I waited 30 seconds and then pressed the call your horse button and a new one showed up. It was fine. So, in sp uh, what do you call it? Uh, in spite, <laughs> as, as much as the game tries to get you to care about horses, it doesn't really work. Uh, a player dealing with horses in this game will first consider them in the frame of their reactive behaviors but, and ultimately in terms of their underlying mechanical systems. Um, and in the context of their underlying mechanical systems, they are interchangeable and infinitely ex uh, expendable. So here is actually where we can make our bridge between animal studies and video games. I'm going to talk now. I'm going to talk a little bit about the readings that I've done. I'm not uh, so. This is going to be a little bit less interesting to look at for a minute or two. So I hope you can excuse me for that. In her book, Images of Animals, Eileen Christ looks at the representations of animals in the literature of behavioral science. So in particular, she observes the difference between schools of thought which have allowed for the description of animal behavior with the ordinary language of human action and those which rely on technical description. So in the first case, by extending this lang the language of action to animal action, certain dimensions of logic in regards to human la action are extended to animals as well. Uh, these being the assumption that the action is meaningful and authored. Uh, the idea of meaningfulness conveys the idea that within their own world, actors experience events, objects, actions, and relations as things that are imbued with their own import and repercussions. Well, authorship implies that actors are able to bring about or to not bring about things as a matter of agency. Now, this kind of writing, Christ argues, allows for the depiction of a subject with the, that experiences the world as a meaningful place, rather than just existing in it. Now, on the other hand, in technical language, the terms used receive their meanings entirely from the viewer's framework. So technical terms like stimulus response, innate releasing mechanisms, or maximizing fitness uh, can't be understood as connecting to the animal's phenomenal world because they're alien to any possible experience of perspective of, of or perspective of animals, pardon me. Now, a logical consequence of this is that animals appear to be blind to the meaning of their actions, and the source of their behavior is something outside their control and comprehension. Now, animals, as represented by technical language, become things as of cause and effect. Behavior is something that happens to an animal rather than an accomplishment of the animal. Now, the effect of this is to characterize animals as mechanical beings. Individuality and subject, subjectivity are conceptually excluded right from the outset. Uh, the same tendency to exclude animal, the possibility of animal minds from animal representations is noticed by Linda Burke in her book, Feminism, Animals, and Science. Uh, what Burke observes is that different methods of knowledge production tend to blur the idea of animals as individuals. Uh, she points to example to reductionism in biology, uh, which is the observation of simple variables and the drawing and drawing conclusions through inductive reasoning from those, um, or the increased emphasis on statistical norms. Um, the naturalists that Christ looked at in her writing wrote in the early 1900s uh, and on their experiences with particular animals or particular phenomena. Uh, whereas by the mid-1900s, the emphasis had changed to hypothesis testing 
in quantitative analysis. So animals are often defined either at the ma micro level or, or the macro level, which is to say either by their genes or by their tax taxonomy as a species. So the subjectivity of the animal mind is excluded from the definition of the animal. So the animal is its body, or the animal is its species, and that's the entirety of it. So Christ argues that the emphasis on external descriptions of animals lead us into falsely conceptualizing them as things without personal inner experiences. Well, Burke finds the individual animal is subordinated to broad <coughs> abstractions in scientific analysis. So Burke uses the phrase beast machines to describe this in reference to a Descartes' conception of an entirely material animal without mind or soul. Uh, Christ's term is mechanomorphism, uh, the conceptualization as, of living creatures as mechanical things, in contrast to, say, anthropomorphism, which is the assignment of human characteristics to other living things. Uh, so let's move back to the game. Uh, there should have been a video over here, uh, but I was unable to get that to work in time, unfortunately, for this particular talk. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of challenges av uh, available in the game. These challenges often involve hunting animals. Uh, you might be required, for example, to shoot a number of birds from a moving train or to blow up a cougar with a stick of dynamite, which is always a good time. Uh, the video which I intended to show you, and instead the image which I will show you instead, uh, is uh, of the completion of hunting challenge number eight, which is to, the object of which is to kill a bear with your hunting knife and skin it. Uh, in the strategy that the player that I watched use uh, decided in, to accomplish this. He shot the bear once. Somewhere in the underlying world model of the game, a number indicating the bear's health was decreased, and then he brought out his knife and had at it. Now, I invite you for a moment to consider what would happen if you went after a grizzly bear with a hunting knife. Or even better, consider what would happen if I went after a bear with a hunting knife. Something fun would probably happen, but probably not for me. So in order to win, in order uh, the, the player, though, gets through this challenge. To do this, he needs to be aware of what moves are available to the bear, AI, the bear AI and what moves are available to him. Uh, completing the challenge, then, is a matter of deploying his own actions in the right order and with the right timing to overcome or counter those of the bear. Uh, what actually ends up happening in the video is that the bear and, bear and the player end up chasing each other around in circles, trying to score hits on each other. You could play yakety sax music, and it would be quite appropriate, and I know this because I did. Uh, challenges like that are set up to test and reward the player's mastery of game mechanics. So from a distance, animals are intended to look like realistic animals. Once you get up close, though, the player is encouraged to consider them and deal with them in terms of their underlying programming. Uh, animals within a game world ultimately become to be defined as active processes, particularly in this game world. Uh, we as players are encouraged to discard them from our mental image of the simulated, we're encouraged to discard from our mental image of the simulated world the notion of animal mind. It's a thing that's interestingly close to Christ's problem of mechanomorphism, uh, in which, uh, since by not being part of the definition of animal, experiences and individuality are things which must be proved externally rather than assumed. And this leads me to the end of my talk. Is there any questions, comments, concerns? Yes. In this particular game, how long did it take you to, to realize that kind of aspect of it? Um, for example, are there any moments where the horse is treated like as a process? And more so, well, like, besides calling it back, I guess that's the, the obvious one, right? So. Yeah, when I, when I was originally looking at this, I was, I was thinking a lot in terms about the, um, the representation of horses in particular in video games. Uh, and it is, it is very often the case in many genres of gameplay that you will not get the complete horse. 
Um, one interesting, th one moment that stands out my, in, in my mind in particular is that a number of us here have, will have familiarity with the game Lord of the Rings Online. Um, and the way that they use horses in that one's kind of funny, almost. The way that it works is that you will purchase a horse license, at which point an icon will appear that the player can click on. If the player clicks on that icon, the, ki the character's avatar on the screen will assume the horse riding position, levitate into the air, and then the horse will appear between their legs and they can just take off wherever they go as fast as they like. So that's, yeah, the shape, the shape of the horse is really just a, narrative, uh, uh, a narrativized justification for letting the player move faster. So yeah. Yes. Thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I do have a, a question or kind of some comments on this. Mm -hmm. I really like the concept of animals and video games and stuff like that. Uh, based on your talk, I can say that they are basically using three categories, probably to add some challenge to the game, mm -hmm. to elicit some emotions or kind of to bring in some user experience in general to the game. And then what comes to my mind is, uh, is there any study that actually tries to examine whether there's some kind of relationship between people's attachment to animals in the real world and how they treat it in the game? I was just kind of thinking of as someone who is kind of a, have developed some relationship in real life mm -hmm. with some kind of animal, right? Probably treat the animal as a pet and then in a video game you're required to deal with it as something. Mm -hmm. When you're saying like it's clearly an animal, maybe you try to kind of kill it or do some kind of very difficult thing to that animal that you're really kind of really have a good relationship with in the real world, I think it's going to have some emotional kind of a challenge, challenging mm -hmm. to, for someone to do. So I'm just trying to ask, is there some research trying to find out whether there's some relationship between this? So, I see, I don't know for certain if there's any actual like studies done on it. I. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were, but as I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I was not able to find anything that specifically dealt with the idea of animals in video games. Which, and I don't know if I don't know if, if that was just the limitations of my own research and the time and the time frame in which I did it, or if there is just a lack of availability of that particular kind of information, or a lack of interest in that particular kind of information. So as you were talking, I'm trying to figure out if there's any difference between the way animals are depicted in video games and how they're depicted in movies. In particular, horses. Let's look at horses. That's what is model of the horses, right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything different other than, you know, modes of transportation, for instance? Um, I realize there are some cases where, you know, cow persons, cowboys actually talk to their horses. Well, in movies, of course, it's all about the image. So there, uh, most of the time, I imagine when you see animals, they're there again to create some kind of sense of realism to what you're watching. It is, um, it is possible to have an animal as a character in a thing, either in a movie or a video game. Um, yeah. Or actually, the, I, I mentioned earlier that when I was studying this, or not, I didn't include a lot of information about in this particular talk because I wasn't entirely satisfied with my conclusions. But I did look at Shadows of the Colossus uh, when I was studying this originally, in which there is a horse that uh, what do you call it. I think they do a much better job of getting the player character, to, the player to care about. Now the thing is, though, is that a lot of the times when you find an animal as a character. Uh, the way that the game get the way that the game or the movie or the what have you gets you to gets you to attach to the animal is by giving them some kind of the char characteristic of a human being. So in a uh, shadow, in Shadows of the Colossus, uh, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't played this yet, uh, there is a scene near the end of the game in which you uh, you are forced to ride your horse over a bridge. Uh, the bridge starts to collapse. And as the bridge collapses, your horse throws you to safety. Um, this is, a, 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 in, this is a, a, something that's missing from Red Dead Redemption, which is an indicator 
that the horses actually have some kind of minds of their own and are capable of intentionality. Now, that said, I don't know how realistic it is in terms of real horses that if one were on a collapsing bridge, its primary concern would be the safety of its rider. So it's, uh, it's ascribing an intentionality to the animal, but it's a very human kind of intentionality. And so yeah, I think you'll find that, I imagine you'd find this a lot in movies as well, is that it, when you have an animal as a character, it's either the case that it's an anthropomorphized animal, which is actually just a human being that looks like an animal, right. or an animal that has been given some kind of human ability. Yeah, I mean, it might, might be worth a look. Yeah. See how that actually works. I mean, the, the, the one element that rarely comes into play, and I don't get me wrong, I haven't seen every movie with horses in them or every, every, <laughs> every game with horses in them, but it's the aspect of care for the animal. Mm -hmm. You know, things happen in, 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 uh, in real life, like animals break their legs, they do all sorts of things, and they get sick and that kind of thing. You, really, you know, we don't normally see that happen, and I know it in, in games or even in movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, in a, to a certain extent, it's the same thing as cars in movies. They, uh, they're they really a lot better than cars <coughs> that drive. You know, you know, two walkers flying through the air and land, the shock absorbers don't take a hit, that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering if it's the same sort of thing. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out, I guess, if the visuals of hoarseness in, in the film on television plays into how we do them in, in video games. It makes sense. We, there's lots of writing about the correlation between mm -hmm. you know, the visual that's developed over the 20th century and on screen and, and how it fits into in movies. Yeah. Yeah, it's worth, worth, maybe worth considering. Yeah. As a, a slightly related question that I'm curious about but don't really have an answer to yet is how important uh, anthropomorphization is too, un, too empathizing with animals, I guess. Um, I read a gentleman named Mark, uh, a book by a gentleman named Mark Turner, uh, who suggests, uh, he st does uh, studies linguistics and cognitive science, and he suggests that by, to recognize you guys out there as individuals, as with your own subjectivity, what I'm doing is identify, recognizing that I have subjective experiences, um, recognizing the behaviors that come from having a viewpoint of the world, and then recognizing those same behaviors within you. So I am projecting my subjectivity onto you folks. And so when it comes to anthropomorphization, you, I, I wonder if the argument could be made that it's necessary to, sim to sympathize with animals because it then allows me to project my subjectivity onto them. But this is just, this is all <coughs> speculative. I don't know where I'd go with it. Yes. Um, I kind of, I've got a few questions. They're all kind of a little, a step beyond the scope of what you're presenting here. So any one of them, pick the one that puts you least on the spot. Okay. Um, I'll start with the one that's kind of close to the game itself. I know there's an expansion to Red Dead Redemption that introduces fantastic creatures, mm -hmm. creep mythical things that you can also kill and hunt and such. Does that change the relationships that you're talking about, or is it just an added, hey, it's cool to hunt down these things that don't exist, too? Okay. I forget. Uh, that I'm actually supposed to be repeating these questions aloud for the microphone. Uh, so I'm going to try to start doing that and feel free to remind me if I forget again. And so the question concerns uh, the expansion for Red Dead Redemption uh, and the fantastical creatures introduced there. Um, and I actually did think a lot about that as I was preparing this. I was also thinking too in terms of say games like Fallout where you fight things that are based on natural creatures, but are much larger or have two heads or basically much more obviously monstrous. And quite frankly, I don't quite know what to think about it. I suspect that it's, I, I think that it's, a, what do you call it? I basically think that it's a difference, a, a slightly different subject. The use of animal characterizations and monster, uh, the use of animals the, monstr the monstrosity of animals. Well, what kind of got me thinking is that the 
tradition of these sorts of creatures in fantasy is to assign mm -hmm. them an agency that's closer to human than we assign actual animals. Like, dragons can talk to us, and we can make deals with them, although we probably usually shouldn't. Yeah, uh, there's... Oh, it's complicated. There's also an... El I think there's also an element to it, though, of um, encountering an other... Kind of thing like in in the expansion for Red Dead Redemption, uh, you are able to tame horses. Of course, some of these horses are the four horses of the apocalypse, uh, which you are able to bring to your side. And so there's, a, I think, part of the experience of that is the thrill of encountering something mythical and legendary and powerful and mastering it. Yeah. There's been kind of a recent uptick in maybe not adventure games, but open world simulator type games you play from the perspective of an animal. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like goat simulator and shelter. <laughs> I, I don't really have a question here. No, what I. Would you speculate on these? I thought of those two. I realized uh, roughly about 11 o'clock last night that the definition that I was working with kind of excluded those games which actually use animals as protagonists. And not, have, not having a lot of experience with those, I'm not I, a little bit hesitant to comment on them. I feel that in, I feel that in some case, in those games, you will be able to find animals that exist kind of within the rules that I laid out here. So I think in Shelter, one, one of the levels has you trying to save your babies from a predator of some kind so that you can see the, mon the animal as monster there. I, w I think also that if, uh, if these games are successful in getting us to think more about, or to conceptualize animals as something more uh, with mi with with minds, um, then the way that it does that is by what we talked about earlier, assigning human characteristics to them. In this case, actually sticking a human brain into the animal avatar, the brain of the player into the player character. So we it, we are we we it gets us to think about animal minds by getting uh, getting us to play the role of a mindful animal. This is interesting. Yes. Uh, but if you are playing in, in that role as a, the mindful animal that has a, a human controlling it, I'm thinking of something like Twilight Princess, where you actually shift between being a human mm -hmm. and turning into an animal. Um, and so there are actual like, functional differences in gameplay. And I think that's an, that could be an interesting avenue for research. Yeah. The, those functional differences could end up being a, a way in which you can rethink your relationship with animals in games. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, execute well, I don't know. But. Yeah, I considered Twilight Princess as a, 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 in the study of this. Mm -hmm. And one thing, uh, and th the thing about that, tra that particular transformation that you talk about is that to, to me that is an example as animal as tool. So it's because we, we, we know the wolf is mindful because the wolf was a human being that turned into a wolf. So he's actually a person. And there's other experiences you have in the game where as, as a wolf, you can talk to other animals and so gain some sense of a sub, their subjectivity that way. But you're speaking to them using human language. So again, it's like you have to bring them a little bit closer to humanity before you get that sense. So, yeah. Anything else? How about chicken play in Lord of the Rings Online? Sorry, chicken play? Yeah. I do not. I'm a level one chicken. Oh. And uh, it's kind of interesting. You give it a shot. That would be interesting. <laughs> you get to see things from the perspective of a chicken. <laughs> Presumably, there's no real research that's gone into what a chicken's perspective actually is. But uh, any other questions, Nicholas? Yes. So, is it a bad thing 
that the animals are sort of relegated to tool status within the game worlds? Is it a bad thing? I'm going to withhold comment on that. The, it, it, it's the, um, I'm, not as, I'm not explicitly going to say that it's positive or negative. Um, <coughs> I think it's a, an important thing to be aware of. I think with regards to video games, it's kind of inevitable because of that thing that I commented on earlier in which everything has to be orient everything has to have some kind of relationship to the player. So it's like in, in the science writing that Kristen Burke uh, wrote about, they're able to imagine different kinds of representations. Within video games, we're always going, unless we get to uh, Janet Murray's idea of the holodeck where it's just like characters can actually have their own sense of subjectivity to the point where they realize that they're a game and escape and take over the spaceship. Until we get to that kind of point, we're always going to have to deal with it. There's always going to be that requirement that things only exist when they're important to the player. So yeah, it, it's, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily good or bad, it's just there. Yes? Sorry, this is more of an answer to no. Christian's question, but uh, maybe I'll put it in the form of a question. Instead of maybe giving it a value judgment, like good or bad or something like that, um, I think it could be like, the idea of animals as tools or resources. Um, <coughs> is a reflection on how we actually conceive of animals in the majority of situations, real, simulated, or otherwise. And there's, uh, I'll ask it this way, do you think there's potential in games to use this model of animals as resources or tools to actually teach us about how we conceive of animals <laughs> in real life? Do I think this is useful in real life? I certainly hope so. Yeah. Um, I do think that one of the big important one of the important reasons why we should be aware of this kind of thing is to kind of to understand the way rhetoric works. I guess to understand the, the rhetorical potential of it. Um, I don't, th I, in terms of human uh, animals ex being extensions of the player, I don't think it's something we can remove from video games. It is something I think we could understand and use. To our to rhetorical advantage, I know in the past I, I have seen vi uh, games in the past that have been used to try to uh, get uh, try to get people feeling more empathetic towards animals. I've seen these games mostly from PETA, and I must admit I have not always been very enthused uh, with their effective the effectiveness of their rhetoric. So it does give a, it gives us a direction to reach in if that's our concern. So, Sean? I have like an observation, I guess I'm gonna say, have you thought of this, which is, um, I don't know, when you're talking about the animals are aggressive or like non-aggressive and how they're functioning as tools, I was just thinking, it seems like all these um, herbivores are like completely docile with no survival instincts. And then like you have carnivorous creatures or omnivores because they could conceivably eat the player, and I just thought that was interesting. It's yeah, <laughs> carnivores are always monsters, herbivores are always yeah. resources. And that's, a, and that's, again, is that thing in which the game, the, uh, when, uh, again, when the authors that I looked at, when they're talking about science writing, they're talk, they are observing this tendency uh, for us to, per, um, particularly Burke noticed this, uh, the default unit of looking at an animal is its species. And so we are, we, uh, we call it, we, auto, we automatically shift to thinking of animals in terms of broad generalizations. And that what you describe is very much the same thing. <coughs> so it's, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so I was just thinking about this question of um, so when you're when you're making a game, you try to only put stuff in the game that is directly related to the player's experience. Mm -hmm. But I mean, 
to my mind, there's no reason in theory why that must be the case. It's just that, I mean, you could, you could build something, like, you know, some kind of animal simulation that has its own objectives and it's, it's sort of ex existence apart from the player. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think maybe the, 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 the reason you don't see a lot of that in games is just a pragmatic one. Like, I mean, I mean, you know, what, what's, what, what's a commercial publisher's motivation to build something like that in, yeah. unless they can show that it's directly related to the player? Yeah, I certainly don't think such a thing is impossible. Uh, but if you're designing a video game, sooner or later you are going to have to deal with that choice of, I only have so, much re so many resources, so much space I can use. What do I include and what do I exclude? Um, and what you include, what you include or exclude will, uh, what do you call it, depend upon your goals with the simulation. Um, if your go if your goal is to entertain or ch entertain, challenge, interact with the the person using the simulation, then that kind of stuff is the stuff that does not contribute to that goal is the stuff that's more likely to get cut. The part of the simulation where it's more likely to slim down. Yes? Actually, there's a uh, very good example of that that has happened, which is uh, Dwarf Fortress, mm -hmm. which is a uh, game in sort of a unique position of being uh, largely made by, you know, hobbyists who are basically just adding on to it over time with this simulationist goal. Mm -hmm. And so um, animals are given a lot of behaviors and identities and all this <coughs> stuff intentionally, but also just as emergent properties of the system, particularly mm -hmm. insofar as uh, behaviors are added to the game in the form of rules about what mammals can do or what things with stomachs can do. And so uh, one of the things that apparently happened recently, which got a lot of people uh, uh, interested, <coughs> was that cats would accidentally get drunk whenever you had a bar around. Because when you had a bar, people would drop their drinks, and the cats would walk through the drinks, and the drinks would get on themselves. And then when they bathed themselves, they would get drunk off of these drinks that were now on their bodies. And all of this was just because of the properties of the cats, and it was never programmed intentionally. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose the player ever really had any kind of interest in a cat that would get drunk from washing itself after getting covered in beer, aside from having known it and seen mm -hmm. it in hindsight and finding it hilarious. But. That's pretty cool. Now, my, my understanding of Dwarf Fortress, though, is it, it, it's, um, it's ASCII art, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Like the, just uses regular characters. And so a lot of the reason why it's able to create such an, uh, what do you call it, complex simulation is that it doesn't have to devote its resources towards creating a brilliant sunset or something like that. So it, it's, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's a different kind of redistribution of resources. Any more questions? One final one? Anyone? Okay. Um, thank you, Nicholas. Thank and you.